session. Thank you so much for joining us, everybody. Welcome to the Plant Power Half Hour. I am here again with my friend and nutrition coach, Paula Johnson. I'm Lisa Mosby, holistic living expert. You know, every week we come to you on Thursdays. We're trying to talk about those things that help us with our health and wellness. And, you know, right now we're in August and we're talking about the immune system, looking at what does it look like to have a strong immune system? So we oftentimes will hear the words immune boosting. And what I really want you to think about is immune support, because we don't always have to boost our immune system. Sometimes we just need to support it or maintain it. Um, An immune, uh, you know, immune supporting diet is what we're talking about today. It consists primarily of nutrient-rich foods that maintain our strength of our immune system, and they may it may actually improve our overall health, which is ultimately our goal, all of us. It's the greatest asset we have is our health. People who have tons and tons of money would give it up if, you know, if, if they're sick and they have tons and tons of money, they would give it up for their health. So our immune system is critically important to, uh, to that maintaining that health. So we're in the middle of our series day week, week two of our immune boosting series. And last week we, we started off with nutrition this week, we're going to dive into the diet. And I don't mean like diet in the sense of losing weight. I mean, what's on the menu, what ingredients should we be including in our nutrition to, uh, to have optimal immune function within our body. Woo-hoo, go Paula. What do you think of immune system? That's how I'm introducing it. What, you know, what do you want to share before we jump into that first category of colored full fruits and vegetables? Yeah, I think the, the biggest piece out of that is we don't think about it when we're feeling good. We think a lot about it when we're feeling bad. And if we can prevent those less down days by maintaining our nutrition and health keeping our immune system strong, we're going to have less issues, but we get busy, we get stressed, environmental things affect us. It's inevitable. We're going to have something affect us, but the way we bounce back can be so much easier, so much faster when we know these tools, when we're using them consistently. Um, And when we fall off, we can get right back on immediately very simple to do, right? Yeah. Yeah. The question becomes, do we give thought to the nutrients on our plate or do we just eat for the pleasure and the joy of eating? Or do we, um, I think it was Dr. Joel Furman. Do you eat to live or do you live to eat? I I, I don't know for sure if it's him, but I know he has a book called live to eat. Um, a couple of them, the live to eat diet. I have both of them on my shelf behind me, but How do we think of our food intake? You know, is it how much nutrition am I getting or is it just the volume of food or do I feel satisfied? Because oftentimes satisfied comes from the food that we eat being nutritious. When we are feeling deprived or I'm hungry all the time, it's because our body needs something. What does it need? And so that's really what we're talking about today is where do we get our vitamins, minerals, you know, all of those nutrients. Let's kick it off, you know, with colorful fruits and vegetables. We've heard that term, eat the rainbow. What the heck does that mean? Oh, well, it's not Skittles, right? It is all the colorful foods in our (laughs) kitchen. And you know, one of my favorite things to do is making colorful food and making what's on my plate look beautiful and appealing and delicious. So yes, for me, it has to look awesome and taste awesome, but I know what I'm choosing has a whole layers of nutritional support and energy and I love to do the salad in a jars where we're layering all the different colors. When you can get that whole variety, you're getting all the different vitamins and minerals and nutrients. And that's why they say eat the rainbow is because eating the exact same thing every single day while you're getting some of that good item, you need a a really big variety Um, and eating the rainbow gives you that variety because every different color has different nutrients. Every variety of texture gives you different, um, fiber levels. It gives you different ability to absorb those vitamins and nutrients and that variety. Yeah. 
variety is the spice of life, right? That's yeah. what keeps food exciting and fun and delicious. So it doesn't have to be boring and yuck to be nutritious. Like you can really look forward to all of the things. So your question earlier about eat to live or live to eat, I've always said I live to eat because I love food, but what I choose for food is the fun part. That's where I live. That's where I find my joy in making it amazing and delicious and not only delicious, but food for me. And then I feel better in the long run. I don't feel that after I eat. I'm feeling good. Energy. We're eating a live food that lifts us up and it does fill Mm -hmm. us up. Yeah. Yeah. Let's be specific. You know, I think of, uh, let's talk about the colors. Like I I probably should have written them down. There's seven colors of the rainbow. Let's talk about those. You know, I think of uh, bell peppers because we get red and yellow and green. So that's like, you know, a triple. I try to stay away from the green bell peppers. They're not completely ripe. I, I, you know, I've heard this before that, oh, green is not completely right, but um, they're a little more harsh on my digestive system. So I'll eat the red, the yellow and the the, uh, orange bell peppers. I tend to stay away from green, but I get my green food in my leafy greens, mostly uh, Mm -hmm. broccoli, carrots, uh, or carrots, broccoli, cauliflower, broccoli. I want to say cruciferous vegetables, but the other two words keep coming out. Uh, (laughs) Broccoli and then like eggplant is your purples, cucumbers are your greens and, you know, kind of has the white inside. If you take the peelings off them, I like the English cucumbers. They have a better, better um, uh, peeling and I'll eat that versus the other ones that oftentimes if you're not getting organic, they put a wax on them and it just has a, not a pleasant texture for me. Mm -hmm. Um, you know, of course your berries, you got blueberries, red berries, strawberries, uh, raspberries, um, there's goji be- or golden berries, which are uh, golden berries are um, gooseberries. I also love goji berries. I mean, in berries alone, you can practically eat the rainbow uh, if people don't. So here's my question. If people don't love vegetables, because I know there's a lot of people out there that do not eat their vegetables. How do we help them eat the rainbow? Because when we're talking rainbow, they're, they're rainbow, there are fruits in there. But we really want you to get into the vegetable piece of it, the sweet potatoes, the, um, you know, other vegetables, your greens. I think of greens a lot. Greens and sweet potatoes are kind of my, and then cauliflower too. I I do a lot of those as I'm thinking about my, my menu. But how do we get people to eat the rainbow, both in fruits and in vegetables? What are your thoughts on that? Mm -hmm. You know, I think we all grew up with, we tried a thing and it was nasty. (laughs) <laughs> and there's so many different ways to cook things. There's so many different options that were available that are available now compared to when we grew up and we tried them for the first time or whoever cooked them for the first mm-hmm. time. So I encourage people just to try a new thing each week. Look for something interesting in the grocery store, find a color and just go after it. Um, purple blues are kind of the harder ones to tackle because there's not as many of them Mm -hmm. but even looking at simple things like instead of a white onion have a red onion or my husband and I argued they're purple yeah um but and the same thing with red cabbage or purple cabbage whichever you want to call it yeah um those are things that are easy to incorporate or just swap one thing for the other if you already have a white onion in a dish, try it as a red onion. It adds a whole nother layer of color. If you're doing a salad, instead of the traditional green coleslaw, make it with the red, Mm -hmm. purple cabbage. Um, Mixing it up and just trying different things, but trying to cook them in different ways. If you don't eat vegetables very often, A great way to start is having them steamed or sauteed or cooked. It's a little bit easier to um, move into vegetables when you cook them because they tend to be a little bit more appealing with a little bit of healthy fats, sauteing them, some salt or some other spices. Ultimately, we want to transition that into getting more raw fruits and vegetables, Mm -hmm. but that takes time. As long as you're getting them, you're starting that journey, 
just keep trying different ones and keep rotating through them and try them in different ways. A lot of people really love the trend of roasting vegetables right now. So, and it's a quick, easy dinner prep too. You can roast your vegetables, you can cook your proteins all on one sheet pan. It makes it simple, you mix it all together and the whole family can just gobble it up quickly but it gives you the variety of trying things. So you can easily make a rainbow of vegetables on a cookie sheet, get them going in the oven with a little oil and seasonings and your family can start trying different ones that they might not have tried before, but having a piece of it instead of committing to a whole dish of it yeah. is a good start. You know, just try it, keep, keep trying it. And don't give up on something since it it's not appealing one way. It can be so good another way too. Brussels sprouts, I'm sure many people have had bad experiences. My favorite. <laughs> they didn't like them as a child. Maybe yep. they got them cooked all soggy mushy. and mushy yep. and gross. There are a lot better ways to cook Brussels, Brussels sprouts. sprouts. Shaving them, roasting them, sauteing them, cooking them with you know, bacon and cranberries and so many other ways to get them in your family um, mealtime as something they're like, oh, I want that. Yeah. Yeah. Just keep trying is, is my biggest advice on that category, because the more variety we get, the more variety of nutrients we get too. And that's what's going to help boost our immune system, keep us energized and keep us healthier. I have a two bite rule. Like the first bite, you go, whoa, nah. uh, or and now as, as I'm older, it's more of a, a two try rule, like order it twice because the first time it's a shock to the system. And, you're, you know, it's like, I'm not so sure about that. But then the second time you kind of know what to expect. You, you know, you can anticipate mm-hmm. the flavor a little bit. And the second time you taste it is really when you can make that decision of yes or no. So maybe it's two, maybe it's three, whatever it is for you. Um, don't don't just say no. Like there's so many other ways to try. Like you said, Brussels sprouts. I hated Brussels sprouts. They were always, you know, boiled and mushy. And now Mm -hmm. I, I mean, I eat them weekly. You know, there's so many different ways and they're just such a staple and they last forever in the refrigerator. So you can always Mm -hmm. have them on hand. You can even um, freeze them and they hold up really well to, uh, to pull out of the freezer and roast and add some seasoning to it. So um, those things that maybe as a child, you're like, no way, never going to do that again. Um, we can open up, we can be open-minded about it and give it another mm-hmm, try. Mm-hmm. Category two I have is uh, proteins. You know, there's lot vegetarian, non-vegetarian, pescatarian, lots of different places that people can land. Ultimately, our body needs protein. Our muscles need protein. It's how we repair. It's how we feed our muscles. We need to get it in there in a way I will do amino acids in my waters. Um, I use protein powders on hike days or walking days or when I'm I'm exerting a lot of energy. I want to get that food directly into my muscles. But part of our dish, part of our plate needs to include some sort of protein, no matter where you fall, whether it's vegetarian, pescatarian, um, lacto-ovo. Let's talk about lean sources of protein. What are our best options? food for thought? Oh, my favorite is fish, um, fish, beef, chicken. Um, those are simple things. And again, there is a ton of ways to cook it. There's a big variety of options. So if you have something that you haven't tried before, it's a great time to see it in a different way. Try it with a different recipe. Um, but getting protein in is really important. Most of us are not getting enough protein. So one of the things I would challenge you on is get some form of protein in each meal. Most Americans do not get protein in their first meal of the day. Really? So putting protein in is very important and consistently throughout the day. You can't just have all the protein at dinner. You need it throughout the day so your body can utilize it, absorb it, spread it out um, through multiple meals, not just one. Typical American diet is what? Cereal? Yeah, I never ate cereal, so I'm like not familiar with that. Like, oh, I I think my highest 
protein meal of the day for me is actually breakfast and it has, that's how I was raised. Mm-hmm. Um, so it's, it's different. I guess it's sometimes you don't realize how your life is different from other people's like nutritionally speaking. Um, what we need to remember is that the body can't, pr- it, it can't absorb all the protein in one sitting. It can't actually get stored as mm-hmm. fat if we are consuming too much. So sitting down and having an eight ounce steak might not be ideal for most of us having, you know, a three or four ounce portion of our protein, four ounce, five ounce portion um, is, is a, better choice uh, because that's how much our body can absorb. For many people, uh, I I don't want to say all, but for many people, 20 to 25 grams of protein per feeding. And so some of us can't, that's not enough in three meals a day. That might be 75 grams of protein. But if we need more than that because of our physical work or the type of job that we have, or we're bodybuilders, we're working out, or we're in a stage in our life where we're doing a lot of weightlifting, adding in that protein drink while you're doing that or adding in those amino acids um, when you're doing your aerobic workout is feeding your muscles too. So everybody's different. And Mm -hmm. we, we just want you to take a look at what is my current diet look like? And do I need to shift or change anything? Do I need help with doing that? You can always reach out to either Paul or I um, if you need some help with that, but looking at and assessing what is my protein intake like Paula said, are you getting it in each of your meals today? Uh, you know, if you're eating three meals, if you're only eating one meal a day or you're doing fasting because you've been following a keto plan, you know, are you getting enough protein for the whole day in that one meal? And can your body absorb all of when you're taking it in? Maybe it might not be optimal for you. So um, this is a big subject. Protein is, is, a, is a big subject for a lot of people because of how we eat nowadays. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Number three, whole grains, foods like oatmeal, brown rice, whole grain bread, quinoa. There's a gluten-free craze in this world and many of us cannot break down or consume gluten. So whole grains, though they have great nutrition, may not be optimal for a large percentage of the population today, but yet our body needs grains. And we, you know, or do we? Like there's some people out there that say we don't. So I'm not sure, Uh, you know, what we need is fiber, fiber from our food. And we can get that from fruits and vegetables. Do we or do we not eat whole grains or can we eat organic whole grains that don't have those extra chromosomes or haven't been genetically modified? Where's the sweet spot when we're looking at brown rice and oatmeal and any kinds of breads or grains that we might be consuming. Pasta is such a huge, I haven't had pasta in so many years um, just because I don't do well on it. So uh, where do, where do, where do you land? I know you're te- typically gluten-free. So I know you've done mm-hmm. a lot of research. I was gluten-free for a long time and now I'm kind of, my, my system is better. Uh, where do you want to chime in on this one? Yeah, I think the biggest thing is be in tune with your body. Mm-hmm. Pay attention to how you feel after you eat it, um, most people notice a lot of inflammation in their body when they have wheat. So consider what is in your products that you're eating. How do you feel that day or the week after? Um, Cause it does linger in the body for quite a while, but bottom line is looking at the source of your food and choosing organic, choosing Um, non-GMO products so that you are getting a cleaner version or something as simple as um, einkorn. Einkorn is a more ancient grain. grain. Mm -hmm. It's easier to digest. So even people with gluten sensitivities like me, I can process einkorn occasionally. So it's um, interesting to see that now that my body has healed, I can accept it a little bit more often, but it's not something that I go to regularly because I get enough from other foods. Um, The main reason people want grains or look to grains is traditionally that's thought of as fiber. And you can get so much more fiber from vegetables, plus you're also getting nutrients and vitamins and minerals at the same time. So I find that a bigger win-win to go for the fibrous vegetables um, because it's going to be more um, valuable to my body. Um, The grains, I tend to stick to grains that 
don't have a lot of wheat in it. So um, like you mentioned, the quinoa. Um, Amaranth is another one. Millet amaranth, is another one that I've used. Yeah. Farrow, um, yeah. yeah, occasionally rice, but that's not a, a common one for us. Um, just because it, again, it doesn't have a lot of nutritional value for us. And we can use swaps. I think that's the thing is, you know, there's so many choices now. You can swap and do vegetable based pastas, or you can use the spaghetti squash, many of us heard, or you can use zucchini and spiralize it. You can spiralize anything. I have a spiralizer. I, I spiralize everything just because it's fun. And, you know, it involves kids and they can spiralize and see those cool things. And we can mm -hmm. blanch them in hot water really quick. And, um, it, and it, it's just a fun way to eat food. So um, there's vegetable options that can swap out some of those grains that so many Americans don't do well on. Right, right. The pastas that also can be a protein source when they're made with quinoa or um, chickpeas. So then it is getting the nutritional value as well as, mm -hmm. as filling that gap and getting the calories and especially people that need more calories in their diet too. Number four I have is healthy fats, looking at omega-3 fats. I read a study recently about how depleted we are in fish oil because we don't consume it. We don't, or not just uh, fish oil, but omega-3 fatty acids, because it can also come from plant or algae sources. Um, I always think of omega-3 as fish oil because what I take as a supplement is a fish oil of omega-3, um, but you can get it from your, um, your uh, chia seeds. You can get it from other sources. We're deficient in it and it affects our eyes. There's a study about dry eyes, 3000 milligrams a day will help improve dry eyes, uh, brain function. Our brain is, what is it? 60% fat. So we need good, healthy fats to, for, for the optimal brain health. There was another study on uh, coconut oil, a tablespoon a day, and they're watching those neurons start to fire. And they were, the, this study involved patients with Alzheimer's, Parkinson's disease, and dementia. And Google it, you can, you can find these studies. I don't know off the top of my head, um, you know, where they were posted, but uh, the data is out there. The science is out there that talks about healthy fats and how we need to be consuming them. There's an illusion of what a healthy fat is, though. You know, we can get it from fats, we can get it from avocados, nuts, seeds, and coconut oil. Olive oil is another one that's um, been talked about a lot lately. Stephen Gundry, Dr. Stephen Gundry, famous um, surgeon, has been talking a lot about olive oil on Facebook and a lot of the social media platforms. So, what do you do for healthy fats? I know I highlighted a lot of those different things. Is there anything you have to add, or do you want to share with folks how you bring that into your diet? Yeah, it is really easy to incorporate, you know, it's whatever I am, I'm going to saute my vegetables in when I'm cooking them, or I'm going to add it as a simple dressing, or I'm simply adding avocado to something. Um, you don't need a lot. It's just a small amount. So I think that's where people kind of have this teeter totter of, oh, it's a healthy fat. I should have all of it. <laughs> all in moderation, of course. <clears throat> but finding that balance and then just finding the tiny ways to add it in throughout your day so that you have that. But yes, the brain health, so important. If our yeah. brain's not on board for the day, the rest of the day is just off. We need that support. Yeah, healthy fats. Uh, probiotics is next on my list. You know, yogurt, kefir, fermented foods. I want to talk a little bit about you know fermented foods. Something amazing happens to these foods when they get fermented. They turn into superfoods, really. Um, and there's compounds such as enzymes and B vitamins that aren't in the initial medium, the initial food, but as we ferment them, we get these added enzymes. And again, enzymes as we age start to deplete, diminish. That's why we see so many cases of indigestion or GERD or, um, you know, acid reflux. Uh, if oftentimes, oftentimes if we add enzymes into our diet, those things will go away and enzymes, you don't have to take a pill for it. 
just eat some fermented food. There's so many health benefits. And in particular, fermented foods are one of the best sources to, to boost the immune system or maintain our immune system and also aid in better digestion of our food. What does that look like? It looks like better skin, decreased you know, uh, inflammation in the body, elimination of acne, elimination of uh, gas or bloating. It improves our, mu our, our mood. Our, uh, so much of our immune system is related to our gut and our gut health. We can improve allergy symptoms. Uh, fermented foods key our key and we're not talking about a lot you can have a half cup of a, a a yogurt that has the probiotics in it a tablespoon of sauerkraut once or twice a day but consistently you know have a tablespoon a tablespoon of sauerkraut in the morning for breakfast if you like that sour punch and taste or add it to your um, your lunch or dinner it's an easy way and you can buy already fermented it's so easy to make your own but don't even bother if you want the convenience of it buy raw fermented uh sauerkraut at the grocery store and it'll be in the refrigeration section and open it up take a tablespoon a day and start to introduce those fermented foods into your diet Key, uh, another one, kombucha. I used to do kombucha a lot and then it started bothering my stomach. You know, when I was making it with an herbalist friend of mine, Heidi, she, she was amazing at kombucha and would have all these gallon glass jugs on the counters. And she'd always ask me, what do you want to add in it? And we'd go harvest some wild, weird thing and make our own. And I, I did great on homemade stuff because I think we manage the sugar better when you're buying it in the grocery store, may have preservatives, may have heat to it. Um, may have more sugar than what my, my system can handle. I don't know what it is, but a lot of them, um, there, I'm, there's particular brands that I do better on versus other ones. So if you've tried kombucha and it, and didn't have a good experience, like we talked about vegetables, go back in, try some of the other brands or find a local herbalist that makes it or a little, a juice shop that may make their own, um, because those are, are wonderful, easy drinks that you can swap out something else that you're drinking. And, and all you really need, again, is one to two ounces of, I would drink way too much. Maybe that was it because when you buy them in the store, it's a 16 ounce bottle and you don't need to drink the whole thing. A couple ounces of it will do the trick. So who knows, you know, I experiment with a lot of things. I probably screwed something up along the line there, but how do you incorporate fermented foods into your diet, Paula? Uh, kombucha is definitely one of my favorites. I have uh, three or four varieties going on my counter right yeah. now. And it is a fun little experiment, you know, yeah. to see, oh, I want, I want to make it this flavor or that flavor and um, keeping it simple. But yes, keeping my sugar level down, yeah. I can control that when I'm making it myself. Um, and it just becomes the fun little science experiment in the kitchen to see. It's so easy. You just do a little bit with that. it and you forget it. Yeah. I love it. Yeah. Well, when I'm there, I want I want samples, girl. You gotta hook me oh, up yeah. and get to town because I have I don't I don't buy it in the store anymore. I, I would rather buy it from you know somebody who's who's playing around with it on their kitchen counter because it just seems like it I don't know. There's a difference. There's a difference that I've noticed. It, yeah, definitely. <laughs> definitely. Do you make do that. you make your own sauerkraut or kimchi or anything? Do you ferment vegetables much? I don't anymore. I have done um, yeah. sauerkraut. It's so easy. Yeah. Literally, it's diced cabbage, salt, and a jar. Yeah. It, it is that simple. Um, and once I learned it, I was like, oh, yeah, why aren't I doing this myself? So I do go in in spurts of doing that again. I think fall and winter, I tend to do a little bit more of that. That's when it's in season, right? Yeah. Um, but yeah, it's a great reminder to get that back um, into my routine again too, but I do love fermented foods. Um, the variety kimchi is a little intense, a little spicy in some. I agree. I agree. Um, hey, I, do you know, do you, maybe, you know, do you know the answer to this? I'm camping for a couple of weeks when I get up there to Minnesota and, uh, I'm, what, can I keep fermented food in my tent? Like I don't have ice and, you know, I don't have refrigeration, but that usually just sits out on your counter. I wonder if I could if that's, I'm trying to figure out my menu so I can live off the grid without having food storage. So can I do that? Well, when you're creating fermented foods initially, yes, it's room temperature. So you're yeah. getting it to ferment at that stage. Once it's ready to eat, 
you yeah, do want to keep it refrigerated yeah. because you don't want that fermentation to it continue and it's going to get more and more sour or more and more intense and who knows what the weather is going to be when you're camping at that stage it could be it could be 90 degrees it yeah. could be 60 degrees and that higher heat is going to be a little bit more intense um i would refrigerate it if possible yeah so you're... i could probably keep it in a cooler and then by the end of the day my ice usually melts and i can get ice the next morning after Mm -hmm. I'm out and about, but if that, if it didn't have ice on it nonstop and, and it was lukewarm water, it's one of those foods that I'd be safe to have. I, I wouldn't, it wouldn't scare me if I had ice most of the day. And then, you know, the water got a little bit cooler in the evening, get ice in the morning and start that cycle again. I might be able to mm -hmm. keep it on hand and be okay with it. I might yeah. play with it just as an experiment. So we'll let you know how that works. <laughs> Number six awesome. I had was herbs and spices. Some of my favorite, I do a turmeric drink often, you know, turmeric and ginger. I use a little coconut cream in it, whip it up. I, I've showed you before the, the one from Young Living that is my absolute favorite. It's already powdered. It's a, a half a teaspoon, I think is all I use. And it's so easy. Uh, so I go to that one a lot, but other things I use uh, for herbs are garlic. I, I uh, use raw garlic. And I, I break it up and I put it into raw local honey and I'll take a teaspoon of that when I need, a, when I need an extra boost for my immune system, I can keep that on the counter. I can keep that in my cooler. I can keep that with me and it's an easy go-to. I buy fresh, real cinnamon and I use that in everything. If I'm, you know, just a pinch is all it takes. So I try to eat cinnamon every single day. You know, these herbs contain bioactive compound, compounds that are antibacterial, immune boosting, or immune enhancing. And so they're part of my diet. How about you? Any other herbs? There's so many to choose from, but those are really, those are in my diet every single day. Yeah. Cinnamon is an easy one that I can add into my yogurt or my coffee in the morning. Um, Turmeric and cayenne, I try to leave those out. Ginger. on the counter, yeah. just like my salt and pepper, so that yeah. whenever there's an opportunity to add them in, I can just give a little shake and pull them in yeah. quickly um, as a fast version. Um, but curious to start um, testing out, making my own turmeric shots and turmeric and ginger shots. So I'll be uh, experimenting with that in the upcoming weeks too. Yeah, very fun. You know, I want to, we're kind of coming up, we're, we're winding this baby up uh, or winding down. I mean, uh, number seven on the list, I put um, limit processed foods, things that have preservatives and sugar because they can actually diminish or decrease our immune system. I love science. So I totally nerd out about this stuff. And uh, there was a, a, a study done after drinking a can of soda that has real sugar in it and how much it lowers the immune system. Like for several hours, you have a lowered immune system. So if you're drinking that every single day, you're opening up your body for, you know, being exposed to some germ or some, uh, you know, um, something that can take hold during that time when your immune system isn't as strong. So looking at our sugar intake and maybe considering swapping that out for other things that support or enhance the immune system rather than diminish and lower the immune system. Processed foods, look for things made with real juices, real fruit. I love monk fruit sweetener. Avoiding some of that highly processed sugar may um, give your immune system a bit of a break. I know you yeah. limit processed food. Any thoughts on this one? Yeah, I, you know, most of us were taught to read that nutrition label, what stuff is in the box. And I would say, change your thinking to read what it says below that, where it says ingredients and the list of ingredients. You should be able to recognize the items that are in there. There shouldn't be a long list. Mm -hmm. um, it should be stuff that is actual real food and that's what your body can process and enjoy. Again, when you're making your choices for the day, I want the most bang for my buck. I'm gonna choose things that have nutritional value that are real foods, not just fillers. So a lot of the highly processed foods of um, crackers and um, snacks and things like that, they're fillers. They're not going to give me nutritional value. So what I choose, I want to be both when I'm making that choice. And that ingredient list is a big key. If the ingredient list says 
dates and cashews and interesting things that I know that's going to be a better choice for me if it is a processed bar or a food um, versus things that are those words that are like gigantic and I don't even know how to pronounce. <laughs> I'm pretty sure that my body is not going to get a nutrient or any immune support from those uh, created items. Yeah. We open this up talking about nutrition, the nutrient content of our plate. So that kind of brings me to the closing of adequate vitamins and minerals. You know, key ones that influence our immune health include vitamin C, vitamin B, vitamin E, vitamin D, zinc, iron, and selenium. Those are the ones that I wrote down. And I'm sure you've probably heard of them before. You've probably looked at some of your supplements for immune support. They contain those. Um, give us some highlights on some foods that fall into these categories. Yeah. Um, you know, vitamin C, we always think of the citrus fruits, right? Mm -hmm. But do. really it's found in a lot of vegetables. You're going to find it in those red peppers. You're going to find it in those Brussels sprouts we talked about. Potatoes, carrot, uh, cranberries, strawberries, um, all of those have vitamin C in them as well. So potatoes are not the evil food. Like there is good stuff in there as well. Yeah. yeah. Um, vitamin yeah. B, greens, greens, more greens, vitamin B. <laughs> What about vitamin E? Because I think that one's a little bit more tricky. And vitamin E is a super antioxidant. It gets, you know, it manages oxidation in the body. Oxidation equals aging. Where do we get vitamin E? Sunflower seeds, almonds, um, spinach, avocados. I didn't know spinach. Huh? Mm -hmm. Yeah, all those greens have multiple vitamins, yeah. nutrients, and minerals in there. So that's a big benefit there too. Vitamin E, so you know, heart support. I, I've never supplemented with vitamin E, but um, heart conditions run in my family historically. And I've been learning more and more about vitamin E considering, do I get, I am addicted to sunflower seeds. I put them on everything. So I, I know I'm getting it, but I'm kind of curious. I would love to have a mineral blood panel done to see where are my levels at for some of these things. I'm conscious mm -hmm. of it more than the average average person, I would say. Um, but do I really need to add some of these things as I age? It's, it's a consideration. Do mm -hmm. uh, you know what? I, I'm going to add it to the list. We need to talk about lab reports. Like how do we get blood testing and things like that done? Because we can do some of that on our own. We don't have to rely on our doctors or we can go to somebody who is an integrated nutrition coach who can probably order some of those things. Hint, hint. Um, <laughs> vitamin D let's go vitamin D last one. Well, and then I know we're way over on our time today, but I think it's relevant, good information, vitamin D defi hugely deficient again in this country, like the omega threes, more and more studies are showing the deficiency for vitamin D. We think about it as a sunshine vitamin. We go outside and our skin will convert vitamin D, but we can get it from our foods too. How do we do that? Paula? Yeah, definitely eggs, liver fatty fish, um, butter, fortified milk, and mushrooms. So it's in quite a few things, but getting it from the sun is going to be a great source as well. And it all affects our moods too. And when our moods and our emotions are impacted, our emotions and stress, again, bringing down our immune system. So getting that sunshine, getting that vitamin D also helps boost our immune systems too. Yeah. Are there any that I missed? I said we'd do that the last one, but I know you did do some research and pull up some things for different uh, nutrients. Are there any that I missed that you have on your list? I want to make sure we share them all. Uh, I, I don't know if you mentioned vitamin A, I do. Um, but that is a great one for boosting the immune system. Most of us think about that as our vision. You know, yeah. Yeah. Um, we can get vitamin A from egg yolks, milk, and butter but we can also get it from foods that have beta carotene. So this is where we've been told, eat your carrots for your eyesight, right? Um, carrots, squash, pumpkin, those all, the beta carotene in that food, our bodies are amazing and will convert that into vitamin A that our body can use, which also supports our immune system too. So again, that rainbow of colors, the orange ones there are gonna be your your go-tos for those vitamin A's. Yeah. 
Lots of great tips today. Thank you for bringing all of that to the table and uh, going a little bit longer today. Thank you for that. I want to wrap this baby up with a final thought. You know, while our healthy diet can strengthen your immune system, it's important to include other aspects into your healthy lifestyle, including regular exercise, which is what we're talking about next week. We'll also eventually get into sleep and minimizing stress. And uh, and if you didn't catch it, go back and listen to last week's talk on proper hydration. We'll give you some ideas on different beverages that can give you a boost rather than a blast, you know, rather than lowering, lowering your immune system. So we're covering all the different aspects, stick with us the whole month, and we'll, uh, we'll keep going on this idea of boosting or supporting our immune system. Final thought is that remember each person's dietary needs are different. So please support your wellness, uh, maybe with a consult to a healthcare provider, a nutritionist, get some personal advice if you need it. Reach out to us if you want some support around that, and we can direct you if it's out of our scope. Um, I am a holistic living act, uh, expert. I've been in the health field, health and wellness field for many, many years and was in practice. Paula still continues to be an integrated nutrition coach and meets with clients one-to-one -one on a daily basis. So we're here to support you on this. If any of this information is confusing, feel free to reach out. We'd love to give you clarity around it um, and stick with us. We'll keep putting these out there because people are still getting benefit from it. All right. I think we got it. We're done today. Awesome. See you next week. Thanks, everybody.